Um, so I knew I wanted to be a writer. And when I first read the Stoics, I was just like, shit, this is it. Not only have I never read anything like this, I've never even heard of anything like this. And so it was just a kind of philosophy and a way of thinking that I hadn't heard in any school, you know, in any class from any adult in my life. And I was like, I want to tell people about this. Um, but I feel like this has been my life recently, which has actually been a good stoic lesson, which yeah. is just like, how do you, how do you accept things that are totally outside of your control mm. and how can you do it with as little frustration and stress and tension as possible? Yeah. Um, why do you need to add that on top? Yeah. And I, I don't, I wouldn't say that comes naturally to me, but it is something that I am working on. Please join me in introducing Ryan Holiday. I'm Ryan Holiday with me here today. Ryan Holiday's great. Too. Oh yeah, Ryan Holiday. Yeah. And when I need advice on writing, I call Ryan. The modern day philosopher, King, Ryan Holiday. I've been a fan of yours for quite some time. You're you're a popular man. Twelve best-selling books. Uh, that's a lot of books. That's almost more books than I've read. Uh, but you have a lot of fans out there uh, from uh, very successful comedians like myself. Yeah. That's sick. That's my favorite follow. That stoic Instagram. To folks in the NFL, to senators, sort of what you speak to goes across uh, many aisles, if you will. I read online that you've read over 3,000 books. Is that true? I don't know. I, I think it's probably bad form to count, you know, uh, li like, like with uh, romantic partners. Yeah, philosophy at its best is what they call the guide to the good life, to human flourishing. Not just to happiness, but productivity and purpose and meaning. It's like if we get one thing per day that makes us a little bit better, that we think about for two minutes, is like, that adds up. What I do is I, I, I am continuing and popularizing that conversation. <laughs> What did you do in Hollywood? Well, I dropped out of college. I worked uh, at a desk in a talent agency, and I started signing new media clients, and then very quickly it didn't work out. But uh, okay. so I was working for this person, and so I was on, he was like, I'll make you into a talent manager, which seemed interesting and cool. And then I was working for Robert. Well, no, so I, I was working for Robert, and uh, I had the 48 Laws of Power on my desk because I was working on it, and one of the partners became like convinced that I was like up to shit. Or whatever. There's supposed to be five people on the call, but there's six because I'm listening. And uh, the boss goes like, uh, "Who? Who's there? You know, who's there?" I'm like 19, and so I didn't say anything. And then I hear like stomping down the hall, and uh, he like bursts into the into the thing. He's like, "What the fuck are you doing? I knew you were up to something. Like, I saw you reading that book, you know." And it's like this whole. He starts slamming the door, just like oh, like he grabs the door and slams it and opens it and slams. He's just like trying to like physically intimidate like this kid. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyways, I just got up and left. I had to walk out on this job. I'm like, fuck, this is what I dropped out of college to do. Like, this is not good. My entire life would have been different had that not happened to me. What did you want to do? Uh, I wanted to be a writer, but I got this really good advice uh, from a writer and he said, writers live interesting lives. So you have to like go do stuff. You have to mm. be around people or in a, you have to go get, you have to go earn having a point of view. You uh. can't just like, you can't just get good at the craft of doing the thing. Obviously that's super important. And that's what I learned from Robert as a research assistant. Like, here's how books come together. Here's the art of doing the thing. I, I was just, I was like, okay, I had this thing to, chance to do this. And then I went from there. I worked at, I was the director of marketing at American Apparel. So I did like weird shit and I was around crazy, crazy people but all of that ultimately informed you know what i talk about i knew i knew i didn't want to be a person who's just like taking a percentage of what other people do i wanted to actually produce and create things but at some point i'd, I'd done these marketing books and i went to my publisher and i was like for my next book i'd like to write it about an obscure school of ancient philosophy mm -hmm. and they were like what? <laughs> you know it was like a record scratch thing 
the big three in Stoicism, and it's Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius? Marcus Aurelius. Marcus's nickname was Verismus, or the truthful one. When I read Meditations for the first time, I was 19, I was sitting in my college apartment, and I was just like, not only have I never read anything like this, I've never even heard of anything like this. Because you have the most powerful man in the world writing notes to himself that he never thinks are going to be published. But he says, uh, stop whatever you're doing at this moment and ask yourself, am I afraid of death because I won't be able to do this anymore? And I think that's what struck me reading Marx Aurelius for the first time is like, when people hear philosophy, they think impractical, they think theoretical, they think abstract, they think incomprehensible, right? Interesting ideas, but that, that don't do anything but confuse you. And then you read Meditations, or you read Seneca, or you read Epictetus, and they're like, life is fucking hard, here's what you can do about it. boil all of Stoicism down as simply as possible. And he says, I can do it in two words. Uh, that's actually three, but persist, resist. And he has this great line in Meditations, he says, let's waste no more time arguing what a good man is like. Let's just be one. So I've got bad news. You're all gonna die. Every single one of us in this room is going to die. There's no exceptions to this rule. I, I'm, I'm not known for my predictions, but I, I feel pretty confident about this one. You know, it could be eight years from now, it could be eight decades from now. We don't know. But to live in ignorance or in rejection of that fact is to set yourself up, I think, more often than not, to waste your life. We know Marcus Aurelius's sort of last words, his last words in, in meditations are about sort of, hey man, this is the play. It only got three acts, curtains coming down. The one, the one benefit of people dying is one way that they can go on living after they die. One way they can improve us and help us after they're gone is, is the reminder of the fact that they're not here, which will be true for you at some point. And that's one of the things that the loss of people that we love can do for us. It's like, hey, none of us get forever. The song ends at some point. And so what did you, um, what did you do with the time that you've got? And the fact that you get tomorrow and I don't is a gift that you should not take for granted. And to your kids? I think I would just, I think I'd just say, you know, what I try to just say all the time, which is like, I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're, you're good. That's what matters. If you had to replace a philosophy quote, if you had to replace live, laugh, love, one of my faves. <laughs> Marcus opens book two of Meditations with uh, a thought. He says, today the people you will meet will be jealous and stupid and annoying and obnoxious and mean. But you can't hate them and you can't let them implicate you in ugliness. He says, because we're meant to work together. Right. You only control if you did your best and if you were proud of it. How am I supposed to be? What should I do? What should I not do? Now take what's left and live it properly.